Good deal. Good deal. Good morning, everyone. I'm getting comments up, and I got a great story to start off with today that's just amazing. But first, uh, I want you to know, and I'll say it at the end too, that Monday I will not be here. I'm going down with my daughter to Palm Springs for cheer. And she is with Cali, California All-Stars. They are really quite well revered as a, a group. There's, I think, maybe five studios. I'm not sure. And they often end up in Palm Springs, not Palm Springs, I'm sorry, Florida, and often take the ribbons. In fact, if you've watched that show Cheer, and I don't remember where, what it streamed on, it's in Texas, it's a JC, and they talk about Cali. They talk about this group and the people that that goes there, but I swore I wouldn't do it. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. I'm going to take it off. But, and then I've got the black and blue shirts and all that. And again, Lennox is in the oppies. And they are not the babies, but the next two babies. But Lennox has been out with pneumonia. Uh, she was really sick. And fortunately, they got her to the doctor on Monday. And she seems to be on the mend. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. John's going to miss it, but I get it. So, also, another really, really, really cool thing happened. I got two emails this morning, and one was from Sharon, and I opened that one first. And she was in um, at the Carol Breyer Fallert show in Iowa, the, the museum show, gallery show. And she said, had she not watched this, well, whatever, that it gave her a deeper and more profound understanding of what Carol does and her abilities. So she was talking to this guy named Paul. <laughs> and come to find out, Paul was saying how excited he was that I talked to him about color when we did the question and answers thing. And so here are these two people that meet random out of the blue in Iowa at Winterset at the gallery. And the, the great thing is, is as soon as I saw Sharon's email, here comes Paul. <laughs> so I love this. I love us as a group. I love us. I, I, I feel like I know all of you, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at some of the pictures that were sent to me and do a little chit chat about it. Okay, then, oh, then, then we're going to get into today's show and you're really going to love it. Actually, it's an interview that Lilo did. It was a five minute interview. And so then I pulled out a chunk of her show so we could see how she did. So Andrea Brokenshire. Okay, so Suzanne sent me this and she calls it something like slime or something like slime snail trails or whatever but i don't know i think that <laughs> that is a that is a name for a quilt <laughs> made out of silk because that's what snails leave behind when they trot across the street right so thank you so much suzanne i for sending that along okay then lori got uh, sent this to me and remember we made this pretty early on during the pandemic. If you're new here, the free lessons are all online. And the sad thing is, is this poor little quilt has had a tragic story. Every time she would get it out for Christmas, something bad would happen. Um, I'm not saying this thing is, you know, jinxed or anything, but, but there was a death, there was COVID, there was this, there was that. And finally, I said, okay, let's just try for Christmas in July, and then maybe you can hang it then. So, um, yeah, it turned out pretty, that's for sure, Lori. And then what's the next one? Oh, and there she is. She's working on the center of this year's BOM. I have to tell you, I just am grooving over that egg beater fabric, the red. I think that's just magnificent. I wish my name were on the salvage. Okay. Oh, okay. So Linda um, is making this for a wedding. I don't think it's a baby quote, a wedding, but the, the recipient couples 
are are super outdoors people. And I know there's a lot of really great panels out there, but I think how Linda handled this is magnificent. Absolutely magnificent with the trees in the bottom and the, you know, the center beautiful panel. Let me show you the back of it too before I answer the question. Look at that. I mean, who wouldn't love that quilt? But the question came up and what it was, was could she use a monopoly on top and should she be concerned about it if this particular quilt is used and used and used? I I do use monopoly. Probably it would be more for an art piece, but I I don't think I would. Then she suggested that she use the 80 weight gray poly in quilter select and something that will kind of blend in. And that's what I would do on top. And I think she always has it in her bobbin too. But then the other question came up. Let's look at it again. Should she do a cross hatch grid in the center? And then do, what could she do in the border? Here is one of my rules for quilting. And rules are meant to be broken, but guidelines, all right? If she did a cross hatch in the center, and maybe even extend it to the stars, I don't know, I would want the border to be something soft and flowy and beautiful. So I, I like to combine the rigid grids with the um, soft and beautiful things. Now, the main thing, um, Linda, is that you want to make sure that one area isn't super densely quilted, because I think you were talking about doing a, a one-inch crosshatch. Then the outside has to be that dense, too. I made a mistake with a silk quilt of mine, hand quilting, where the inside was super tight quilting, and then the outside edge were feathers, and mm -mm, it, it, I, they were too open, to, com to go with the inside, which was straight, 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 straight. So, and also another trick that I do, go back to this one. Let's say you did do the crosshatch and you extended it to the stars. And I'm not, I'm just giving you things to think about. I wouldn't necessarily then extend it out into the second inner border. I might have whatever the beautiful things are on the outside, and the quilting will show, especially on the top, um, into that second inner border. So thank you for that question. I, I, quilting design is one of those things that we can never stop learning, and that's why I love Cindy Needham so much, because she opened the world, world of templates to me. So thank you, Linda, for that question. Okay, Pearl. Pearl, we're making each other smile and laugh. Pearl, this is hand done, hand quilted, and batik with a batik back. So she wrote and shared this with me and said she did it because I think the other day I said something like, I would steer clear from batik if I'm hand quilting. Now here's the million dollar question. When I used batik for the backing and the top, it was... 35 years ago, maybe. I mean, a long time ago. I have steered clear of batik for handwork since then, and I wonder if it hasn't changed a little bit. I'm going to have to check that out when I go to the local quilt shop. But also, she sent me this quilt that was actually um, taken from a rug design. And I saw this, and the artist is, I will tell you right now, Carla Gerard. And I just smiled because, yep. Yeah. And I, I thought, that's her, man. That's her. I've done a couple of her puzzles. They're artifact puzzles. They are not for faint of heart. <laughs> they're, they're, you know I love Liberty puzzles. And I've turned you on to them. And Gerard are also wood, pu wood puzzle pieces and they are not necessarily easy to put together. And if you do any of these sort of puzzles, I would recommend you don't start with the outside edge because it's not going to go together like peanut butter and jelly. And then uh, Pearl sent this, and she said Janet Stone inspired her to do this piece. And they're like all little separate pieces that have then been put together. I, I, I love it, Pearl. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. 
Okay, I want to show you some of Andrea Brokenshire's um, quilts before we get into her little interview, before we get into how does she do that, all right? So you will note the blue ribbon on the right, and she takes up ribbons a whole lot of time. How does she do this? It's fun. It's dreary here today, and this is taking me out in my mind to Alden Lane. I love this particular quilt. In fact, I think this was hanging on the set of the quilt show when she was on. I can't remember the show number, but it will come up in a moment when you see Lilo's piece. Her work is just staggering, and I think what she showed on the show is not how, on, on TQS, on her episode, is a little bit different than how the quilt was that was hanging in the show, and we'll get into that later. Isn't that just magnificent? Just beautiful. Okay. How does she get these designs? That's going to be answered for you. Wow. It looks like on the background of that, it is done differently. It's done the same way that the quilt, quilt that she was demoing on the show was. You'll know what I mean in a moment. Just beautiful. Well, basically, you design the flower or whatever first. You do that, and then, well, you know, I'm going to make you wait and watch it. <laughs> I just, I just, I just, just feel so good with it being so dreary outside. Oh my gosh, right? Come on. So let's take a look at Lilo's interview with her, and um, then I'll we'll watch the fourth segment of that show, which will explain a lot. Here we go. Off we go. Hi, we're at the Houston Quilt Show on the floor, talking with Andrea Brokenshire, who has been on the Quilt Show not once, but twice. And she's here standing with her first place winner, Ice Lilies. Yes. Tell us, for those of us that don't know about your work, this is not appliqued, this isn't pieced, it is? This is a whole cloth painted quilt. So think of a painting. Yes. That is then stitched to give it its so it starts dimension. out with as a white piece of silk, silk charmeuse. Bag. All right. And then it is painted. And then it is painted. Yes. And why do you use paint versus dye or some or adding appliques or any of the other things that there are, there's options? Right. I use paint because I can tint the paint. I can mix the paints to create the colors that I want to have. Whereas a dye, it's pretty much a one-shot deal. Now, so. do you start with the background first and then add the elements in the foreground or do you start with the flowers and the leaves and then paint in the background? It depends but for the most part I start with the focus point. So on this quilt I started with this flower and then I did this flower and then I did the leaves and then I painted the background. The background. And so tell us about ice lilies because you, you, you're known for doing lots of florals but yes. this one is really special. This one's a special one to me. This is a, a stargazer lily from my mom's garden and the background leaves is my great grandma's snowball bush and I what the reason why I made this quilt was for that and what is that this is the stem I was really interested in creating the leaves and uh, the juxtaposition between a smooth leaf with a linear vein against a serrated leaf that was much darker and I like the the contrast. Chain, the contrast of the two. So the flower is beautiful and I love it but it's not really the reason why I made the quilt. I made it for the greenery and for the background of this piece. And so I'm assuming you take a lot of photographs. Yeah I do. And so was this one plant or is it a flower from one photograph and a stem from this, another? This one is one photograph. Wow. But I have piecemeal different pieces, um, different photographs together. But this particular one, I liked everything about it. So I didn't change anything. Uh, and all the background, if you notice in here, if it's 
in the back. It's all done in this pebbled tone right here. And that's and all machines. In, in, on a domestic machine. On a domestic machine. Machine. So it's all like free motion quilted domestic machine. But all of the back, if it, it dip, even if it's a leaf, if it's a background, it's done in this pebbled look. And anything <laughs> foreground that I wanted you to see, it's all in either straight stitching or vein work. So it's the detail. But anything in the back, so it would it would recede and kind of just be the prop. Right, because this is what that. you want everybody to notice. Right. right. So can we peek at the back a little bit? You sure bit? can. Okay, let me show. I'll do the side. I try to make the oh backs my gosh. look as gorgeous it is as a so front. gorgeous. So you're not blending the color in the back. You want the color. I want. On the I want it to look like a two tone, a two sided quilt. Yeah, and, and you want to show off how lovely your stitch work is as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's taken a lot of practice to get to this stage. And right. when I first started making quilts and doing um, my quilting, they had busy backs. But there was a time I just said, okay, I'm just going to jump in. And so now all the backs have a black Kona background. And so, and over time, I'm adding more and more bobbin colors or background colors to create even more of the design. Interest. Yes. Well, that's design. why you won the blue prize for yeah. first place. So well, congratulations. Thank you. It's another stunning quilt. Thank and you. Thank you very really, much. Really, really pleased. So if you're here at the show or you come able to see it, make sure and stop yeah. by. And thank you for wanting to come and, and hear about my quilt. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Yeah. It's always great to learn how you put a quilt together. Okay. Absolutely. Well, great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, right? Absolutely wow. Hey, John just came in while this was going on, and somebody's saying things like there's weird flashy things going on on, on some of the streams. We don't know what that is, so sorry, guys. But, okay, so we've just watched that, and now, and now, how does she do it? So I went to her show, and John pulled out the last, um, the last segment of the show, it showed 2803, and I'm going to share it with you. If you want to know about how she preps the fabric and all that, you would want to watch Chapter 3. And then, of course, Chapter 2 is her show and tell, and then Ricky charms us with Chapter 1. Again, 2803. Let's go take a look-see. Welcome back, everyone. So I have no doubt that those of you that wear glasses have experienced the pandemic fog, right? <laughs> right. And Andrea is going to do a demonstration where truly you need your glasses on and the mass is causing too much fog. So I'm keeping my distance for now. But you're mm -hmm. going to go into the painting part of this, I which am. I know is I what's am. going to be so exciting. I am. We've got to do the prep work. Yep. But uh, let's pretend that the piece that I did earlier... It's is dry. now gotten larger <laughs> and it's dry and it's dry overnight right. okay right. so where are we at what do okay. we do okay so the next step is to transfer the silk that you just did and made and primed onto your pattern so the pattern is what we did earlier is on a piece of freezer paper this is the mirror image on this side but when you flip it over it becomes the correct orientation so what we do is we'll take this silk we peel it off of the, the freezer paper that we already had. Now, I used to do this whole process on the pattern, and I found that sometimes the sizing got on the edges and it completely messed up my piece. So freezer paper is so inexpensive, I just sacrifice a piece of freezer paper, and I use this for underneath 
work. So. Okay, so before you put the silk down, just for a second, mm -hmm. would you turn this photo around before you put yes. the silk down? Or okay. maybe you can. I just want to show that the orientation is the same. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Here, I'll turn it this way. So, so that we can see that the two, that the line drawing is now exactly like the photo. Yes. Okay? Yes. Yes. See, with all the ups and downs and insides and ups and downs, I just wanted to really oh, drive def that def home. definitely. So I peeled. Now, are you going to iron that? Nope. Nope. No, I'm not. I just peeled it directly off. You can feel the right side and the wrong side of the silk. The wrong side is kind of sticky because all that that primer that it it it, it went, to, went the to the bottom and it settled and it dried and that it way. And it just sticks. And it sticks. So you that don't have to amazing. iron it at all. You just position it. Um, where you want your image to be, and then I just smooth it out with my hands, and I will show you how once wow, it's smooth. That is amazing. Look at that. I mean, people and that know me know that freezer paper is like one of my three things I can't live without on a yeah. desert island, but I've never seen it stick like that. That's yeah. amazing. Now at home, I have 48 inch wide freezer paper. Oh. And so I do this on the big, you can't, the giant. You stuff. can't say that and not tell us where we're going to find it. Uline. Uline, U -line. Okay, which you is can... a, a shipping packing company, right. right? So I'll come in here and I rub it down both ends. So one of the benefits of having this is if I paint on my kitchen table, so a lot of times I have to move my materials. And this way, everything's always stuck together and it's not moving and shuffling. I don't have to tape it. I don't have, so it's all here. Okay. So uh, I like that. I like that. And I, I'll just roll it up or leave it flat. What you don't want to do is bend your pattern at this stage. You don't want any creases. You don't want, because if you do, when you paint, the, the paint, paint will puddle will, in the right. creases and And you, then you'll have lines and uh. you're like, oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay. And it's ruined. So you, at this stage, you just want to make sure your freezer paper does not have any okay. creases and lines. So at this stage, we're ready for the paint. So this is when we use our handy dandy color copier copy that we have and I'm looking for a light tone within each of the petals because I'm going to build the color. I'm just... Are you going to start from light and go to dark? Is that I'm, generally? Yes, yes. I'm going to build. I can keep on adding layers of color until I get the final product, let them dry in between. So sometimes in some of the, my larger quilts, they'll have four or five layers of paint that are on top that, are, that come together. All right. So we start and we're ready to go. So, so let's talk about your paints. Tell us about okay. the paints that you've So got what I here. use is Prochemical and Dyes transparent textile paint. There is textile medium within the paints itself. This is the um, extending medium with the water that we use to prime. I just put it in a squirt bottle so it's easier to use. Okay. And I keep this with me in with all my paints. And you've made it and into I a And I made palette. a little, and I did. And these are the colors that I'm using right now. This is the rose, and this is a magenta and a purple. And I'm looking in your palette, noticing it's kind of all, even already blending together. Is mm -hmm. that a problem? Nope, not a problem at all because I blend. We use a plastic plate or a clear plate, as long as it doesn't have color on it. Okay. Because I, so if you wanted to reuse it, um, because I mix the color on the palette okay. itself. So what I want to do is initially, I'm gonna just move it around and I'll take, I like the this, and a little paint, notice how I didn't use a lot of paint. A little paint goes a long ways at this stage because you can always add, you cannot take away. Sure. So it's always better to be, be cautious. And what I'll do is I'll take this light tone. Now that might be a little bit darker than I needed to be, so I can just kind of bring it, bring bring it, it in. until I get so to where... So show everybody what section you're going to be working on, okay. Look, uh, on the photo, on okay. the actual color photo. Okay, so we're going to work in this section down here. And I've already done some of the work. I just wanted to show how I start. Okay. When I got to this, this, this is the first layer. So this is just blocking the color, showing where the lights and where the pink is. And so I don't actually- Now when act you say blocking the color, what does that mean? It means that I won't know where the dark tones are. So I don't accidentally put a color where it doesn't okay. belong. And, and so it gives my eyes a place to rest. On the previous one, take that one away. On this one, you can now know where to do it because you've got the line drawn. Mm -hmm. Do you turn on your light table for this or do I, you leave it off? I, at this point, if I, um, I do not have the light table on. Now, I have, if, if, 
if it's a very complicated piece and it's really hard to tell where the light are at this stage of the game, I'll pull out that black and white line drawing that I did initially to create the master, and I can lay it on my light table and it sh with the light on, and it shines the light and the darks. So you know, because right now we're looking at like paint by number, and we right. don't know what right. paint so, that is. So but I'll if you the have on. the Yes, if you've got the, the black and white one, you see the shadows, shadows and you see and the that, lights. And that, that helps. helps. Okay. But I only use it for the in initial part to lay the right. color down I because no it changes the color and you need to see what it is. And the, you could see how it changed from the light on versus off. Sure. See how different it is? So sometimes you need you, you need to All not right. have that. We're chomping at the bit to see painting okay. happen. Okay, okay. So, so. so this is the first layer. So this is, this is the first layer is done. This is the area that we're going to work on. I actually did that one at home. And then when I made the second one, I left it open. So okay. this is what we're going to work on today to make it look like that. And that is because you've already put your blocking down. You've already put the first mm -hmm. layer down, but it's not dark enough. Right. So you're going to add add more to it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to come here, and this is when you start becoming one with your piece. I bring it really close so <laughs> okay. I can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to, okay, I'll move it over here. And this, I know this is scary because I'm right on my paint. Yeah. But if you can see, there's not a lot. It doesn't drip. I, okay. don't, I don't really worry about it. But now I'm just going to grab a little bit of color from my places and kind of eyeball what I'm seeing on the piece. So I see kind of a very purpley, magenta-ish tone with a little bit of, that's old rose. Okay. So now the, I use a number two chisel blender brush. And this is really important if you're working on stuff. So you want one with stiffer bristles. Like this one here is a synthetic hog bristle brush. And this is a sable, synthetic sable brush. And I use the number two chisel brush. I, most, all, most of my quilts are painted with this size brush, even the big, oh, even the big ones, you know, because okay. I need if, if I'm doing swashes of color, then I'll increase the, okay. but I'll use it. Okay. You so, paint and we'll talk, okay? Okay, so I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to look and see and I just, 45 degree angle, and I just kind of start brushing in and work. If I'm going to an edge, I can massage the color up. Notice how I'm putting the paint on. It's not bleeding. It's not going crazy and going not where I want it to go. That's because we prime the silk. Okay. Now you keep you keep painting, okay? okay? You're not allowed to stop painting because we want to watch that. But I have some questions for sure. you. I want to know what a chisel brush is. A chisel brush is a flat brush. Okay. It's a flat versus, versus the versus, round. Are there so round. Is that the only two kinds that we can get? Well, it, there's usually flat or round. There's fan brushes. They look like fans. Yep. And but basically, a chisel brush is a flat. Okay, and the brush. one that you're using right now is your primary brush, and remind us what that is. It's a number two chisel blender, and this is the Espresso brand from um, Royal and Lang Nickel. Okay, and it has um, slightly stiffer bristles than others. I found that Taclon is, an, is a type of synthetic bristle. Okay. Um, it's too soft. And, and I'm glad you're saying these things because those of us that really need to know, we need to know. And if we've forgotten, we can go back and listen to you say <laughs> it again. And then while you continue to paint, tell mm -hmm. me the other brush because you did bring two brushes. I and you did. Mentioned it briefly. And they, I bought both of these brushes um, initially at Hobby Lobby. You can get them at your crafts, local craft stores. And that's one reason why I brought them. So you don't have to special order brushes. You can get them. Um, but you want to have one that has a stiff, stiffer brush. And if you have any questions, I'd ask the art department or the, you know, because I'm looking for a stiff bristle brush. I'm going to, because this is a, a different um, um, technique than, than regular painting. Okay, uh, now as you're doing that, I canvas. notice every time you go to the palette, you are not necessarily dipping right into that raw paint unless no. you bring it into the medium and yep. mix it a little bit that's darker. That's right. And the reason why is because Less is more. I can always add the paint later. And by moving in it, every time I, I mix around, it's a slightly different color combination, which gives a more natural look. Right. And the other thing that I'm going to just mention to everybody <laughs> is that this is not going to be a quilt that you're going to make in a day. No, a, a, no. Or two days or three days. This, because you're going to spend some time with this drying and you're going to add layers. How many layers do you think you've ever gone with this? The most? Probably. Um, about 10. 10 layers. On, on a red quilt. Wow. 
red quilts, they dry ghost, they have a ghost tone, like a, a, a um, looks a little cloudy. Right. And I don't like and that. And you didn't want that. Now I you said that. that this is going to dry lighter than what mm -hmm. we see right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got to look at it tomorrow, look at it the next day, mm -hmm. and then figure out what and you got to do to what, do over What that. needs to be done. All right. Now here on this quilt, there's a little bit of a lip that you, you can, and I didn't paint that earlier, so I'm going to add that right now okay. to finish it, and it's a, it's a light tone. So I'm just going to come outside of that darker edge. All right, now for the sake of uh, time, let's go to the finished, or at least what you, you're getting okay. close to finished now okay. and show everybody what this could okay. look like. Okay, when it's all said and done. And lay them so that we can kind of see one next to the other too, right. if you would. Excellent idea. I put that out of the way so I don't make right. a mess. Move those out of the way. So here's the kind of the reveal, everyone. And okay. So oh, this wow. is, let's yeah. put them in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So this is the final piece that's ready for applique. So it's, it's all said and done. So if you notice, this is where I was working on. See the darker areas around the edges. There's sure. a little bit of the lip and the little spots, I guess, that, that are on there. Uh, the other thing is, when you're painting a quilt and you do multiples, I never paint the same thing twice. So every, if I tried to, I could never recreate this. Of course. It's sure. going to look different because I'm picking up sure. paint. Different light, lighting is different. Um, my mood, <laughs> whatever it is, it's um, different. So. Well, I think it's great. I think it's beautiful. And you, you do finish these up with a turned edge applique and right. put them down and finish. And mm -hmm. of course, the quilting is spectacular. I hope all of you have enjoyed seeing this process. I love seeing your quilts. Oh, and, thank you. You know, you've solved some of the mysteries, but the one thing you have to do is take your time and yeah. be this patient with it. This is a lesson of not immediate gratification. When she said that she cuts it and appliques it, that was the my ta -da, ta da That's how she does it. I love how she has the master piece that's all drawn with pencil. I mean, I'm not saying I could do it, but wow, when I saw this. Now, if you wanna see the prepping and all that, go to, um, go back to, I, I don't know what's going on with your audio and stuff, everybody, uh, but you can go back on YouTube and pick up there and you'll be fine. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's going on because it's working in John's office. Uh, and then the one that she had at Houston was all painted. So please go take a look at that show to get the full scope and picture of it. The other thing I wanted to say is Diane got hold of me. I forgot to say this in the beginning. And somebody asked about clogging spray. You turn uh, basting spray, you turn it upside down, go outside, and then, the, and then you spray. It's a little bit of wasteful, but it cleans out your nozzle every single time. Yeah. All right. So Saturday, Friday, Barbara Black is going to be here with uh, our BOM. And John said that she has some alternative ways to approach this whole thing. Okay. Then on Saturday, D is going to do bias tape love letters. I love this. I love this. And again, these are all at 10 Pacific time. Um, I, I I I will for sure watch this when we get back. And I had to laugh because somebody wrote, said, man, competitive cheer. Whew! Yeah, it is a whole stinking thing. So I will see you next Wednesday again because I'll be coming home with my daughter on Saturday, Monday. And I hope you have a lovely weekend and continue to learn and grow as a quilt maker. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me. I really appreciate it.